Just wanted to know what you thought. Okay, so guys, here we go. Oxidation reduction. So guys, I understand. You're 17 years old. You can't tell up from down. Your life is spinning in circles. You have no idea if you're going to get into a college. Life is crazy. But you just got to trust me on this. I'm an old man. Time stretches out for me. Believe me, I've been thinking this because my oldest son turned, well, my only son, but my oldest child turned 15 today. He's halfway to 30. Actually, that's what I told him this morning. I'm like, Cody, dude, you're halfway to 30. Shut up, Dad. Yeah, I know. And all of a sudden, I'm an adult. So here's the deal, guys. In your little world, time just goes on forever. But you are going to blink, and guess what's going to come up on the screen? This, again, in March. And it will be the last unit of the year. And it will take us four days. And when we're done, we're done with the year. And you're just studying for the AP test. And it goes like that. So guys, here's the scoop. This is the last stuff we're going to do this year. And we're going to do a deep dive on it. And you're going to get frustrated because the vocabulary is difficult. Um, but guys, understand for today, for now, for up until then, you just need to have a general sense of what oxidation reduction is all about. Now, guys, here's the scoop. You ain't done this before. You sort of did precipitation reactions before, even if you didn't call them that, because they're just double displacement reactions that make an insoluble product. You did that last year. We did acids and bases last year. So the homework we just graded was not completely foreign. This is completely foreign. And so we're going to get into this slow. I'm going to give you as much of this as you need to get by for the rest of this year until we hit March, and then we do the deep dive. Okay, so fundamentally, guys, what is oxidation? Okay, so yeah, let's talk about it. Because if you understand where the word comes from, you'll understand what it means. You ready? So when you hear oxidation, it makes you think of oxygen. The reason they called this process oxidation is because when they originally started studying it in the early 1800s, they found out that this is what oxygen does to stuff. So they figured if oxygen does it to stuff, it must be unique to oxygen. So we're going to call it oxygenation, which then got cut down to oxidation. So guys, let's think about this. What does oxygen do to stuff? I mean, just not even as a chemist, but just as somebody that lives in the world, if you got stuff and if you got oxygen around it, what does it do to it? It makes it rust. That's oxidation. What else does oxygen do to stuff? Makes it spoil. That's why we suck the oxygen out of things when we vacuum pack it. It keeps it from spoiling. That is also oxidation. So spoiling and rusting are both oxidative processes. Now, let's talk about what that oxygen is actually doing. So we did this a couple times as we were grading homework. This is, ox this is oxygen. <coughs> Oxygen is a metal or a nonmetal. Oxygen is in the upper right hand corner of the periodic table. Given this information, talk to me about what oxygen will do when it reacts with other substances. It's an electron stealer, right? And it's a good electron stealer. Why? Because it's got two places to put electrons. It's also very abundant. Guys, there's oxygen everywhere. So oxygen is abundant. Oxygen has a place to put electrons. And oxygen is highly electronegative. So when something rusts, guess what the oxygen is doing to that metal? Stealing its electrons. When food rots, guess what the oxygen is doing to that food? Stealing its electrons. And so guys, fundamentally then, when something oxidizes, what it is doing is losing electrons. Where are the electrons going? Well, initially we thought it was to oxygen. It turns out that it's not just oxygen that does this. There are other elements, just a second flare, there are other elements that steal electrons, some of them better than oxygen, like fluorine. 
Fluorine oxidizes just about everything. It's scary stuff. But guys, we took this backwards then, and we said anything then that describes the losing of electrons is oxidation, because that's what oxygen and other elements are doing when they react. Go ahead. It means there's lots of it. Yep. Okay. So guys, you good on oxidation? All right. So guys, how do we know if something gets oxidized? Because guys, bottom line here, we can't see electrons. So how do we know if something is being oxidized? Well, guys, we have to rely on secondary evidence. The secondary evidence that we look for is a change in charge. In the same way that we've never seen a black hole, and yet we know black holes exist because of what they do to neighboring stars and systems. Guys, same thing here. We can't see electrons jiggle around, but we can detect and measure charge. And if we have a substance whose charge becomes more positive, we know that it's been oxidized. Does that make sense in your head? Why would being oxidized make the charge go up? Because electrons are negative. And if you're losing negatives, your charge becomes more positive. Does that work for you? Okay. So guys, then the question becomes this. Where do those electrons go? If the substance that's being oxidized is losing electrons, they can't just go away and they don't just float around in space. Where do they go? Well, they go to another element. And guys, the other element, not the electron loser, but the electron gainer, is the other important part of this process. And that process is called reduction. And the thing that is being reduced is the substance that is gaining electrons. So reduction is the gaining of electrons. Now, guys, why would they call gaining electrons reduction? Because the charge is being reduced. The charge is going down. That's exactly where they get it. So, guys, the idea here is that the charge is going down. And so, actually, that's my little rule of thumb. Guys, the way that I remember this is the little thing that's on the board here. The charge of the thing that is being reduced is reduced. And that's where that concept comes from. Does that make sense? You okay? Okay. So now you got the definitions. Now I've had students that have come to me and they've said, I can't, and you gotta, you gotta be able to identify this. What's being oxidized, what's being reduced. And so I don't, I, I can't quite get my head around this. And so it turns out, remember that University of Utah summer program that I invited you to go to? Did any of you go this year? None of you guys did, right? No? I went. <laughs> you did? Yeah. How'd it go? Uh, did you get credit? Yeah. Okay, good enough. So remember when you learned this at the U? Do you remember the little word game that they gave you to remember oxidation and reduction? No? They, they like this idea, oil rig. Do you get it? Oxidation is... L, loss, reduction is gain, oil, uh, oil rig. You see, that's just how brilliant college is. In college, they come up with stuff like oil rig. I know, see? When you get your PhD in chemistry, you then can then come up with things like oil rig. You do. When I got my master's degree up at the University of Utah, I was actually in the ed psych department, but I was actually taking PhD level classes. And um, one of my professors, her, her rule, this wasn't a science class, it was an ed psych class, and we wrote a lot of papers. And her rule in her class was that you could not write your papers in the first person because until you have your PhD, it doesn't matter what you think. You understand first person, right? The letter I, I believe, I think, I did, I do. 
you could not write your papers in the first person in her class because you didn't have a PhD and she didn't believe that you mattered. It's called inheritance. It's called college. Okay, so guys, this then is the idea. Let's pull this all together. You ready? Whether you like oil rig or not doesn't matter. We now understand that oxidation is losing electrons and reduction is gaining electrons. Guys, this is important. You can't have one without the other. You can't gain electrons, reduction, without something losing electrons, oxidation. Electrons just don't spontaneously appear. But similarly, you can't have oxidation, the losing of electrons, without them having somewhere to go. You can't just spit out electrons and they float around free in space. They have to have somewhere to go. So guys, when we pull these two processes together, we actually flip the order and we call these redox reactions. R-E-D, reduction, O-X, oxidation. And together, we call this redox or oxidation reduction chemistry. So guys, fundamentally then, what is an oxidate? What is a redox reaction? And it's simply this. A redox reaction is a reaction where electrons are being exchanged between two substances. Now again, guys, when this happens, what we can actually measure is a change in charge. And you may remember last year where we talked about the charges of atoms and we also called them oxidation numbers, and all the oxidation numbers were given on your really nice periodic tables that you don't get to use anymore. But guys, those are what oxidation numbers are. They are a measure of how many electrons an atom has gained or lost. Now guys, I, I know that this is not fresh in your memory, so we're gonna play with this a little bit. So what we're going to do is this. I'm going to give you the rules for identifying oxidation numbers. There's five or six of them. You're going to write them down. Then what we're going to do is we're going to do two example problems where we are going to identify these reactions as oxidation redu redox reactions, and then we're going to write and balance them. Guys, at that point, we're done. You're going to have probably 20, 25 minutes to work on your homework. Um, I'm going to need to talk with you, a couple of you, about things like summer work and, and chapter outlines and stuff like that. But you're going to have a good amount of time to get your homework done today. Okay, so guys, here we go. Rules for assigning oxidation numbers. Write them down. Rule number one is this. All atoms in their elemental forms are understood to have an oxidation number of zero. I understand at this point you don't even know what oxidation numbers are. Well, let me give you the rules and then we'll, we'll fully flesh this out. That was loud. Okay, you ready? Do you guys remember this? So let me give you an example. For example, if you look at, let's go aluminum. Guys, aluminum has how many valence electrons? One, two, three. Three valence electrons, right? So what does aluminum want to do? Give away three or pick up five to get a full octet. Give away three. It's a metal. It's an electron giver aware. So when aluminum gives away three electrons, what does its charge become? Plus three. And then we talked about this. Aluminum goes plus three. And then we talked about the idea that we could write it either way. We could either write plus three or three plus. Guys, that plus three, three plus is the numbers that we're not are the numbers that we're talking about now oxidation numbers but guys there's enough confusion about this that i just want to say this right now on the ap test on 
we will not hold you accountable for which one of these is correct. Okay, you can write them either way. When you get to college, your professors will hold you accountable for this. So let me explain to you the difference. You ready? Here's the deal. When we write aluminum three plus, this is understood to be an ionic charge. So this means that aluminum has lost three electrons. Get the idea? So when it says three plus, it means three positive charge, and that means it's lost three electrons. That is not what this means. This actually means that it is sharing three electrons. And when do atoms share electrons? When they covalently bond. And so guys, the idea is this. When you write it plus three, that is understood to be what is called an oxidation number, which is the number of electrons the atom is sharing. When you write it three plus, that is understood to be an ionic charge, which is the number of electrons the atom has lost. College professors love to nitpick this because it tells you the difference between ionic and covalent bonding. We're not going to worry about it, and you can write this either way, okay? But with that said, here comes rule number two. For any monatomic ion, monatomic means atom made, I'm sorry, ion made of one atom. For any monatomic ion, the oxidation number equals the charge of the ion. What is that saying? What that's telling you is it doesn't matter if you write it like this or if you write it like this. Again, in college, they'll, they'll get all uptight about this. But guys, all that that's saying is you can write it either way and you're fine. Number three. <clears throat> Actually, sorry. This is explaining the difference between... Don't write this down. This is explaining the difference... Now it's gone. Now you can't write it down. Okay, rule number three, non-metal atoms typically have negative oxidation numbers. Write it down and then think about it and convince yourself you understand why. So guys, let's say it again. Non-metals typically have negative oxidation numbers. Where are the non-metals, left or right? Right. Higher or low electronegativities? High. Why do they have negative oxidation numbers? They take in electrons. Okay? Now, guys, what about hydrogen? Hydrogen, kind of like the Apostle Paul, is all things to all people. So, guys, hydrogen can go either way. Hydrogen's got one valence electron. Can it lose it? Yeah. Can it gain one? Yeah. So which one does it do? Well, it depends on the other guy. So if hydrogen is bonded to a nonmetal, it will lose its electron. Why? Because the nonmetal is strong and the electron will transfer to the nonmetal. If hydrogen is bonded to a metal, then hydrogen will play the role of the electron taker in her and it will be negative. And then, guys, the last two rules are these. The sum of all of the oxidation numbers for a compound is zero. The sum of all the oxidation numbers for a polyatomic ion is the charge of the ion. Now that your brains are sufficiently scrambled, let me let you write this down. We'll look at two examples, and you're going to go, hey, I get it. Realizing that that's also the difference between high school and college. In college, your professors will just let you struggle with the concept. In high school, I actually feel a responsibility to help you learn. And so if I show you some examples, I think you'll get it.
And guys, understand, there actually are some really, really good university professors. Who, well, I should say, there are university professors who are really, really good teachers, but they're the exception and not the rule. What's that? You'll get them what? It's hard for I could have sat here for half an hour and I would have never come up with that. That's amazing that you tracked with that. That's a, wow. Oh, so I'm the only one. Never mind. Okay. Okay. All right. That was just a really bad joke. Yeah, that, that was horrible. And yet clever. I think my problem is I was having flashbacks to all my horrible university professors. Um, well, it doesn't matter because this is the case everywhere, but I did my undergrad at Wyoming and my graduate work at the U. I did. Yep. Yeah, I actually quit teaching for a year and a half and went up there and got my master's degree. Yeah. You guys ready to go? Not yet. What's up? So it's my master's is in educational psychology, and it's a uh, a five semester program. But I went summer and then a year and then a summer and then did a couple uh, like extension sorts of things. So I was a I was a student on campus for four semesters, and then I had to do a couple classes like kind of like online, and that was enough. You guys all caught up? Okay, so guys, I understand that this is all just sort of mucky muck in your brains right now. What we're gonna do to make this hopefully make sense is we are now going to look at a couple examples of oxidation reduction reactions. And as we do, we are going to assign oxidation numbers to the elements. We're gonna figure out who's gaining and losing electrons. Remember, gaining is reduction, losing is oxidation. And we're gonna piece this together. So, Guys, what you're going to find out is there's actually a couple different types of oxidation reduction reactions. What do they have in common? Metals. When we think about oxidation reduction reactions, they will be reactions with metals. And these reactions will either be a metal reacting with a salt or a metal reacting with an acid. And I'm gonna show you an example of each. So let's just start with metal and acid. So guys, these are generally single displacement reactions. That's helpful to understand. So typically the way that these work is you have a metal that begins in its elemental form and it is ionized by either an acid or a salt. That's typically the way these go down. We're not going to deal with this immediately, but you'll also find out that some of the uh, precipitation reactions that you've been balancing are also oxidation reduction reactions. But we don't have to talk much about that right now. So in organic chemistry, you spend a lot of time tracking down electrons. Who is asking me about Lewis acids? Yeah, in organic chemistry, you, you're very concerned about electrons. So in as much as that's true, this sort of would feel like organic chemistry, but this is not organic chemistry. So guys, let's, oh, no, we're okay. So guys, let's do this. We are going to look and we're going to, you may want to write this bigger than it appears. You may, you know, make it big. So guys, this, and actually, you know what? Let's just do this. I'll write it down on a blank sheet and we'll just work on it together. So here's the example we're going to look at. Zinc. 
and hydrochloric acid. Why did I choose this as an example? And guys, frankly, the reason is because you, and I don't expect you to remember this, but you balanced this equation last year. You may remember when we did the reaction types lab. For some of you, this is all you remember of last year. You dropped the zinc into the hydrochloric acid, you stuck the test tube over the top, you stuck the burning splint in and it popped and you giggled, right? Okay. All right, now we're coming back together. All right, so guys, this is not the pop and giggle. This is what's going on inside the test tube when you put the zinc in the hydrochloric acid. And you may remember that it began to bubble really vigorously. Do you remember that? What's going on inside the test tube? And you wrote the balanced equation for this and you found out that it was single displacement. But let's talk. So guys, just in general, let's, let's just write the balanced equation. So guys, zinc is a metal, and then we've got hydrochloric acid. So does the zinc hook up with the hydrogen or the chlorine? The chlorine, right? Zinc is positive, it's a metal, chlorine's negative. Now guys, I'll just tell you right now that zinc, write this down with me, is plus two. But here's the problem. Zinc is not plus two here. Maybe I shouldn't have, oh, I probably shouldn't have had you write that down. You know what? Erase it or cross it out. This is going to be a great learning moment. So guys, can, can you picture it? Can you picture doing this reaction? Can you picture the piece of zinc that you dropped into the acid. Remember the zinc looked like this, right? This is zinc. This is that. Now, has this zinc lost any electrons yet? No. Has the chlorine come along and stolen electrons from the zinc? No. So this zinc is in its elemental form, so its charge is zero. So when an element is in its elemental form, when an atom is in its elemental form, its charge is understood to be zero. Now let's do HCl. Where is this HCl? Solid, liquid, aqueous, what is it? It's aqueous, right? It's hydrochloric acid. It's in water. So if we have a... Uh, I'll write it down here. If we have a beaker full of HCl, what's really in there? Hydrogen ions and chloride ions. We understand the hydrogen actually goes to water and makes hydronium, but we're not going to worry about it. So guys, this is actually plus one and minus one. These are dissolved in water and they are ionized. Now, what happens when the reaction takes place? So the zinc and the chlorine get together, right? What does the chlorine do? It steals electrons from the zinc. Now, guys, how many electrons does zinc want to give away? Two. Remember, if we look at zinc on the ion chart or on the periodic table, its charge is plus two. Zinc goes plus two. Because if you're not sure what I'm talking about, what does this little number two right there mean above zinc? that it gives away two electrons. So if zinc gives away two electrons, zinc wants to go plus two, chlorine is minus one, so this is ZnCl2. Remember that? Let me keep going. Now guys, what happens to the hydrogen? It gets displaced, right? But it doesn't go off on its own, what does it do? H2, do you remember that? That's it. So guys, now let's assign charges to these. Chlorine is still minus one, right? What does the zinc have to be to make it balance? Plus two, right? And we know that zinc goes plus two because that's its oxidation number off the periodic table. Now, what is the oxidation number of hydrogen? Zero. This is hydrogen in its elemental form. You will never find this. 
hydrogen does not hang out on its own. It goes H2. But now some of you are saying, wait a minute, what about that? Isn't that hydrogen on its own? No, that's not hydrogen. What is that? Hydrogen ion. And that is not the same. So guys, hydrogen never hangs out on its own. It goes H2. So its oxidation number is zero. Okay, so now guys, let me see if I can grab a big enough eraser to get rid of my mess. Now let's balance it. One zinc, one zinc, one hydrogen, two hydrogens. Now it's balanced. You good? Okay, now guys, let's do this. And I know that we thought we were past this, but we're going to break this down. Let's write the complete molecular equation. Zinc is a solid. Hydrogens are dissolved in water. Chlorides are dissolved in water. Does zinc chloride dissolve in water? Yep. There is the complete ionic equation. Everything that is soluble in water has been broken apart into ions. So guys, kill the spectators. Get rid of the spectators. So when we go through to get rid of the spectators, is zinc a spectator? What does this look like? A chunk of metal. What does this look like? Dissolved in water. What does hydrogen ion look like? Dissolved in water. What does H2 look like? Bubbles. What does chloride look like? Dissolved in water. What does this chloride look like? Dissolved in water. There's our spectator. So now, guys, when we write the complete ion, or the net ionic equation, we get zinc plus two hydrogen ion, and that yields zinc ion and hydrogen gas. Now here's the question. Who's our electron loser? Zinc starts at zero and it goes to plus two. What happened to this zinc atom? Lost electrons, how many? Two, two. you can do this with me. Lost two electrons. Now guys, what happened to the hydrogen ions? Hydrogen goes from plus one to zero. So what happened to hydrogen? It gained electrons. How many? Each hydrogen gained one, but how many hydrogens are involved? Two. So this is the gaining of two total electrons. Does that make sense? Okay, now guys, listen to this. Given what you've got on the paper, which substance is oxidized? What does oxidize mean? Oxidize means lose electrons, oil rig, oxidation is loss. So guys, who was oxidized? Zinc. Who was reduced? No. It is not hydrogen. Hold on, guys. Hold on, hold on, listen. Guys, hydrogen was not reduced. This is hydrogen. It was not reduced. This is what was reduced, and it is not hydrogen. It is hydrogen ion. And guys, now you're going, hold on, hold on. Guys, you're getting giggly, which means you don't appreciate how important this is. Guys, that's critical. What does this look like? It's dissolved in water. It's a proton. What does this look like? It's bubbles. It's a gas. Guys, in your, forgive me, but I mean this in the truest sense of the word, in your ignorant little brains, you guys are thinking that these are the same, and I may as well just call this hydrogen. Guys, hydrogen and hydrogen ion couldn't be any more different than a snake and an elephant. They are completely different things. 
this is hydrogen ion and this is hydrogen and you cannot call them interchangeable names because they're not the same. This is a molecular gas and that's a proton. They are not the same. Do you understand the difference? Let's do another one. So guys, the next one that we're going to do is we are going to look at what happens when we add a salt. And we're going to look at iron and copper 2 sulfate. So here's our metal, iron, here's our salt, copper 2 sulfate. So guys, let's assign oxidation numbers to these elements. You ready? What is the oxidation number for iron? Zero, it's in its elemental form, it's a nail. Now, what is the oxidation number for copper? You look on your periodic table and it could be plus two or plus one. Which one is it? We look up sulfate, you don't even, you memorize it. What's the charge of sulfate? Minus two. So if sulfate's minus two, what does copper have to be? Plus two, now slow down. You now need to know the oxidation numbers, not for sulfate, but for sulfur and oxygen. So how do you do this? Well, guys, look at sulfur. Sulfur has multiple oxidation numbers, and we don't know which one it is. So what do we do? Guys, think through this with me. Oxygen is always minus two. Now, if oxygen is always minus two, what is the total negative charge from the oxygen? Minus eight. Now guys, watch this. What is the charge of sulfate? Minus two. So guys, think about this with me. If this whole thing is minus two, and if oxygen gives us a total charge of minus eight, what does the sulfur have to be? Plus six. Let's say that again. Guys, this is the last rule that you learned from assigning oxidation numbers. The oxidation numbers for all of the atoms in a polyatomic add up to the charge of the polyatomic. So, you understand that sulfate is minus two. You know that oxygen is minus two, but there's four of them. So that means that SO4, this entire thing is minus two, and these oxygens are minus eight. So if the oxygens are minus eight, what does the sulfur have to be to give us a total charge of minus two? And that's plus six. Go ahead. No, you can do what I just showed you. Okay. Now, guys, let's figure out our products. You ready? Go back to what you knew before. Iron wants to give away some electrons, right? It's a metal. How many will it give away? Look at the periodic table. What are its possible charges? Two or three. Which one is it? We don't know. Technically, guys, you can't answer this question because you don't know whether iron will give away two or three. So if you ever get in this spot, and they won't put you in this spot on the AP test, but if you ever get put in this spot, what we will do is use the number that's in bold, okay? What number is in bold? Does yours have both of them? Yeah, the three and the two are both bolded. So it's at this point, I choose the one that's easier to deal with. I'm going plus two. Just a second. So guys, if iron is plus two and sulfate's minus two, what do we do? One of each. And then guys, what happens to the copper? Goes off on its own. Go ahead. That's tr true. So if the iron ended up being plus three, what would make it lose three 
they would actually end up balancing at six and you would have three coppers gaining two and two cop two irons losing three. Let's do it. No. Yeah, no, it'll, it, they, uh, I understand what you're saying. They'll all, they'll, oh, I, yeah, no, they'll all go the same. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so the deal with oxygen, if you notice that it can go negative one, when it does that, we don't consider it to be oxygen, we consider it to be peroxide. So if you've heard of hydrogen peroxide, hydrogen peroxide is actually a compound where oxygen goes minus one and it's a whole different creature. So we're always going to treat oxygen as minus two. Okay, Okay. so guys, this is Fe and SO4 and this then is copper. So guys, now, now we need to pause for a second and I know that we're two weeks into the year and, I, and, and guys, here's what you're gonna find. As we move through this year, I'm testing the waters because we're learning hard stuff. And sometimes it's easier to learn hard stuff when I can also make it entertaining. And I can tell you stories about college and I can sort of add little. What I'm starting to find is that you guys have a hard time, some of you dealing with that, because the minute I get your brain going like this, thinking about other things, you never come back. So. This is my opportunity to bring you back. And what I'm saying to myself right now in my head is this is a group that needs to be more business and less entertained. Because when we go entertained, you go like this and you never come back. So understand guys that, that one of my jobs is to sort of push and test and ping at you and see what you guys can handle. And what I'm learning is we don't handle entertained. So under, as things go on then, as I'm thinking, hey, let's tell, no, can't do that. Let's just keep working. And that's fine. I mean, it's who you are and our class will have a personality, but this is me inviting you back. This is important. So let's do this. So guys, now what we need to do is we need to assign numbers to these. So sulfur, this is still in sulfate, right? Sulfate didn't break apart. So this is still plus six and minus two. So guys, the take home message here is if your polyatomic doesn't break apart, it will not change charge. But now guys, what's the charge of iron? Plus two. Sulfate's minus two, so iron is plus two. What's the charge of copper now? Zero, it's on its own. So now let's do this. Guys, what happened to iron? Well, iron started out at zero and it went plus two. So what happened to iron? It was oxidized. Copper started at plus two and went to zero. What happened to it? It was reduced. It went from plus two to zero. The charge was reduced. It was reduced. Do you get the idea? Okay. So guys, I thought you were going to have 20 minutes to work on homework. You got about 10. So, guys, as you are now...